why have I lumped Modigliani and Giacometti together for this talk? The answer lies in the observation that their styles were so idiosyncratic and individual that it could be said each was basically his own art movement, his own unique art movement, though they were very much of the 20th century avant-garde. What they especially had in common was a desire for non-representational art through elongation, perhaps influenced by the 19th century African tribal artifacts, and in particular the face masks which flooded Europe in the wake of the exploration, exploration of the Dark Continent by people like Speak, uh, Livingston, Stanley Burton and others. So let us begin with Modigliani and hope we have time enough to do Giacometti justice. In 2008, while on a short holiday in Madrid, mainly to see the city's art, the Prado and the Sofia and Thyssen galleries, I chanced on an exhibition of Mondigliani's work in a small square, and I took this photograph. The huge, massive nude, as you can see, they've draped over the facade of the, of the uh, gallery where it, it was being held. It seemed to me a very understated exhibition, no flags or whistles and few visitors, but it gave me an excellent opportunity to come close to his work. Amadeo Modigliani was born in 1884 in what we call Leghorn, but I think it's Livonia, um, I can't remember the Italian, Livorno, somebody will know it anyway, um, Italy, and died of uh, TB aggravated by excessive drinking and drug addiction in 1920 at the age of 35. So it might surprise some of you that he has such a short life, yet produced some of the most iconic paintings of the modern era. His subject matter consisted almost entirely of portraits and nudes. <laughs> Both his parents were impoverished Jews. His mother, Eugenia, wrote that at 13, Modigliani already saw himself as a painter, and at the age of 14, after being ill with typhoid fever, he joined the studio of a local painter, Michelli, only to succumb again in sickness, uh, to sickness, this time pleurisy and TB. And then we have a, a very early self-portrait painted in 1899. Nonetheless, in 1902, he enrolled in the Academy of Fine Art in Florence, and the following year in the same, uh, he enrolled in the same course, but in Venice, where after a short time, he decided his future lay in sculpture, surprisingly, which is why there are almost no paintings of Modigliani's from this time. Sadly, because of ill health, the dust from his sculpting made it difficult for him to pursue his goal, and therefore painting won out in the end. When he arrived in Paris in 1906, it was said that his appearance was striking and his manners elegant. And there's a photograph of him. He was an instant success with women, even when sober. It was also said his ideas were large and his talk larger and prone to fantasy. He was proud of his Jewish background and would introduce himself with the words, I am Modigliani the Jew. But this pride may have contributed to hard times. When quick success did not come, his self-esteem turned to bombast and the self-destructive character of a drunken, quarrelsome braggart. He belonged to a group of Parisian artists, many of them foreign and characterized by their alienation from society, their poverty and their brilliance. Thus he quickly gravitated towards the artists' quarters of Montmartre and enrolled at the Academy Colorossi. In 1908, Modigliani began to visit an artist's colony founded by Dr. Paul Alexandre. 
later to become Modigliani's patron. In the following year, he painted three portraits of the doctor, of which this is one. Now we can already see the desire for elongation, though he was perhaps a tall man anyway, and certainly slim. But straight away, Modigliani's style is asserting itself. At the same time, Modigliani also formed a friendship with the sculptor Constantin Branguzzi, and for several years devoted himself to sculpture. Head 1911. This led to the so-called Modigliani style and its elongated and deformed figures. He was also painting, of course. This is a very early painting, 1909, a painting of Pedro. Not, not sure who Pedro was, a friend, I think. And also this next one called The Horsewoman, which is, um, in which we can see his, his subsequent style beginning to reassert itself, um, the very angular features and the um, subdued colours, they're almost washes really. This latter painting was a commission, but the sitter refused the painting. She probably expected it to be more representational. Um, we don't know how, what she actually looked like. In 1912, he submitted seven heads to the Salon d'Automne without success. And here is a photograph of the Salon uh, exhibition of that year. And you can see his heads there and there and another head there and another head. And then there are three more heads uh, somewhere. The head on display at the Tate and surely inspired by the African tribal carvings he came across in Paris museums was one of them. And again, we can see straight away the desire for the elongation of the features. But as I've said, the dust from sculpting played havoc with his health. And after 1913, it appears he turned exclusively to painting and drawing. By 1914, discouraged with sculpture and his ill health, and his life reduced to drug taking and alcoholism, he was at times compelled by circumstances to sell his drawings in the Parisian cafes for a few sous or simply the price of a drink. This kept him at arm's length from society. As far as painting was concerned, he began experimenting with different styles. This one, an expressionist portrait of Frank Haviland. Clearly got cubist elements there, as well as all sorts of things going on. Impressionism, I, I suppose, as well, expressionism, all sorts of things, very experimental. But this next one called The Bride and Groom, um, it definitely got clear cubist elements. You've only got to look at the gentleman's nose, which uh, Modigliani has attempted to show um, both the nose in profile and head on as well. And he's drawn, uh, suggested a line right through into the chin. So the cleft of the chin there is elongated into the uh, bow tie. And also he's sort of um, separated the face of the bride with a, a line from her nose through her mouth um, and towards her chin. Notice how the eyes are blanked out. This is a common feature of Modigliani. Some eyes blanked out, some eyes not blanked out. Um, he's, this, uh, this, this, the, the groom has got one of each there. There followed several more Cubist portraits, including this one of Beatrice Hastings, a South African journalist who moved in with Modigliani for two years from 1914. It was a tempestuous liaison. Now that is a photograph of Beatrice 
Hastings. And so you can compare that to the portrait that he made of her. And note, no, notice straight away how he exaggerated the length of her neck and given her these round, very rounded shoulders. It'd be very difficult to recognize Beatrice Hastings from, from this, this portrait, I think. And notice also the blacks and reds of the background, which he seemed to favor, um, the sort of crude washes. And also, um, very a la Magritte, the back of the chair disappears behind her head and then doesn't reappear on the other side as you would expect it to. Obviously intentional, but to what aim, we don't know. As I said, the, it was a tempestuous liaison between the, the two. It only lasted for two years. She said, and I quote, he once threw me out of a window when I tried to castrate him. As with subsequent portraits, this one seems to hark back to his sculptural, sculpt, sculptural aspirations. Notice the disappearance of the chair back, as I've just mentioned. <clears throat> and this, as I say, is what Beatrice actually looked like. In 1916, he painted Jean Cocteau, capturing Cocteau's self-appointment as the high priest of culture through the angularity of his upright seated position, prominent cheekbones, pointed chin, small button mouth, he favoured small button mouths at this time, um, did Magliani, and, and the nose again in profile. So this is more of a, you might say, an expressionist uh, painting. The typically distorted representation of the eyes are more noticeable in the next portrait of Paul Guillaume, a Paris dealer who favoured African art and handled some of Modigliani's work. Modigliani often represented eyes, as I've said, as blanks or or he crisscrossed cross them with um, hatching. Here, the, the, the right eye is blanked out and the left eye is, with, is left without a, an eyeball, as you can see. Notice how the sitter's broad face defeats, defeats the artist's attempt at elongation. Yet curiously, whatever distortions Modigliani uses, whether the face is elongated, compressed, inflated or pulled together as a vague likeness, the features seem to fall harmoniously into place within the curtilage of the facial expression. And I think this is the magic of Modigliani. How does he achieve um, these, the, these paintings? How does he achieve, achieve the success that these paintings obviously manifest? In the same year, in 1916, Leopold Swarovski, and I'm sure I can mispronounce that, so apologies, but anyway, Leopold Swarovski and his wife took over from Guillaume as the chief promoters of his work. And here's a portrait of Leopold. By now he had broken with Beatrice and embarked on numerous affairs, among which one was with Simon Thiru. She bore his child. There's the portrait of Simon. And more representational, I suspect. Um, and more successful as a portrait. And notice how the head is inclined towards the left. And, 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 and of course, as you'll, as you'll see as we progress through the through the, this mini exhibition of his portraits, his skin tones are veer towards uh, yellow and pinks and yellow ochres and, and reds. And she a tremendous amount of rouge on the, um, on the far cheek. Uh, the backgrounds uh, are, are basically washes of dark colors, um, maroon on the, uh, left there and on the right here more 
the ochres and raw siennas probably. Now that is what, that is a photograph of Simone. It's in, it's in profile, unfortunately. I, I couldn't find that photograph uh, of, uh, facing forward. Um, I'd, uh, I'd be interested to know what these women thought of their, of the Modigliani's representation of them. It's said that uh, he ended their relationship brutally. One affair quickly followed another. Some women attracted to his talent and or his rakish lifestyle. He was good looking, of course, and full of charm, especially when intoxicated. And to say his private life was dysfunctional may be an understatement. It's said by contemporaries that he was generally untidy and his clothes shabby. Frequently broke his paintings, bringing him in almost nothing. He often relied on his women to support him financially. Among the group of immigrant artists whom he befriended was Shame Soutine, a Lithuanian Jew. He painted several portraits of him without sparing his unusual features. This one, Shame Soutine, seated at a table. I'll just let you look at that. Um, he, he didn't bother to dress for the uh, sitting, did he? He looked his, his uh, tie is disheveled around his neck there. Uh, and and Modigliani wasn't particularly interested in hands either. They're rather naively painted in most cases. But I think the, back, the, the background works pretty well. I like the blues and the greys of the background. They're more of a wash, really. And, and the, there's a curious discrepancy in the colour on the left-hand arm here, um, for whatever reason. And uh, Modigliani never used, or rarely used, line, firm, bold line. They were usually, the, his lines were very, usually very jagged. It was around this time he began to paint nudes. This is Beatrice seated nude. And this one is in, is in this country, the Courtauld Institute. Again, look at the contrast between the light yellow skin and the dark, dark much darker uh, face made up basically of, uh, of reds and raw siennas. I'll just let you look at that for a moment. This one, painted in 1917, is the largest painting of Modigliani's entire oeuvre. It measures nearly 58 inches across and was offered for sale by Sotheby's in 2018 for a figure in excess of $150 million. So this is the, I'm going to see, uh, give you a series of nudes now. It's thought that most of these nudes were professional models. Just let you absorb them. Again, the head inclined towards the right and the background consisting of, a, of uh, washes of reds and very dark browns. This is a more elongated uh, nude, the, the face clearly elongated and the uh, hands again naively painted. Notice how the, the um, left hand is sort of tucked under her chin there. And again this propensity for these, um, these washes of crimson and, and, and and uh, burnt siennas, I suppose. Is and, then he, and then we've got these blues at the top and these yellow ochres and, and lemon yellows at the bottom. 
A critic wrote, it is his capacity to reveal general truth within the analysis of detail that makes Modigliani a major artist and establishes his succession to the grand Italian manner. I don't pretend to understand what is meant by that. However, his explicit depictions of nudes also prove controversial and led to the police censoring his only solo lifetime exhibition on the grounds of indecency. This was at Beth Files Cal Gallery in 1917. In 2018, interestingly, 10 of these nudes were reunited uh, at an exhibition in the Tate, which some of you may have um, chanced upon. By 1917, he'd taken up with a 19-year-old student, Jeanne Hebutin. And there's a portrait of Jeanne Hebutin, with whom he enjoyed the nearest thing to a marriage. And there she is, um, photographed. So I don't know what she thought about her portrait but presumably she'd accepted his style. Um, notice how her eyes are just blanked in with a very light blue and again we've got the v elongated neck and the round shoulders. Be I, I defy anybody to relate um, the accuracy of this portrait to the actual subject on the left, on, uh, on the right. Together, they moved into a studio on the Rue de la Grande Chaumière. And there they are in the studio. They look as though they are struggling a little bit um, financially, I would say. The clothes, his clothes, absolutely bespattered with paint, as you might expect, and notice he's smoking as well. Um, but she uh, hasn't exactly dressed for the photograph, so obviously you're happy to have the photograph um, to show them uh, working in, in the studio. It said he painted her, though never in the nude, as the idyllic modern woman. And here are four po portraits of Jeanne. This is a much brighter portrait, as you can see, in the nice bright colours. <clears throat> and the head inclined to the left this time. And notice how the cubic, cubist influence is asserting itself again into the facial features, especially the nose. Sorry, went too far that time. <clears throat> Another portrait of Jeanne. The hand is painted very naively. It's impossible to, to work out how many fingers she's got on that hand, as you can see. And again, the eyes are asymmetric and blanked out with a pale blue. This is my, perhaps a more successful painting of Jeanne, which she might have found more acceptable, I don't know. It's still an elongated face, but not almost, almost acceptable as a representational art, I think, maybe. Uh, you'd have to say her features were more conventionally painted. A new assuredness and calmness can be traced in this next portrait, Victoria painted in 1917, her poise seems to come directly from her personality. The more highly mannered style was yet to come. In 1918, Modigliani and Jeanne moved to Nice, where she had his baby, whom they also named Jeanne. His stay in the south of France certainly had a bearing on his art, as can be seen in this portrait, The Young Apprentice. Notice the bright southern tones, uh, suggesting more a decorative painting than a portrait, possibly.
not such an elongated um, face this time, perhaps, uh, but the hands uh, are typically naive and no real attempt to paint the furniture or the walls with any consistency. Um, and the lines, of course, he's not really interested in firm line, as you can see from these, these curious table legs. These legs seem to me to be from another table. They don't, they don't actually gel with this table that he's leaning on, but it's certainly a, a bright image and the same model posed for the next painting, the little peasant. This is uh, dominated by the color blue, as you can see. And the features again, very naively painted. The nose um, just suggested by a right and, and a left line and the button mouth again, and the eyes blanked out in uh, light blue. I think it's the brightness of the blues that are attractive in this particular painting. In La Belle Epicier, we see Modigliani's new classic format, rounded shoulders merging with long neck and narrow head. Well, we've seen this before, but this neck is particularly wide, too wide for the head, surely. And uh, the, we've seen the round shoulders early on but uh, more accentuated than this. <clears throat> the girl's face is scarcely characterized at all. And in the background is a rare attempt at natural features, which is something we rarely get um, in Modigliani's work. Uh, we've got a two or three trees, three trees to be precise there. These paintings, all the same size, should have sold well, but they didn't. There was an exhibition organized by the Sitwell brothers in London in 1919, where his dealer did manage to sell some. While in the south of France, he also painted um, Seated Boy with Cap in 1918. Curiously, the boy is painted in a slouched position. Round shouldered and uh, it's almost the figure, not an inverted S really. Um, his eyes are blanks again. These Mediterranean paintings with their use of bright light reveal a relaxed artist with an absence of fuss and economy. Oh, with, with, with painted with economy, I should say, not with an absence of economy, but painted with economy. But I, Basically, in format, they don't differ a great deal. I don't think many of Mod Modigliani's paintings are, differ with, uh, greatly from one from the other, really. It's a very definite style that he makes his, his own. Girl in a White Chemise was another which found its way into the Sitwell exhibition in London. He's ex uh, using uh, lilacs on the right here and blending them with the um, with washes on the on the left. It's all very vague what's going on in the background. There's some suggestion maybe the chair that she's sitting on. And again, we've got these skin tones, which are anything but uh, natural. Another saucy picture this, as you can say, she's bearing the, the left breast. Little Girl in Blue, painted in 1918 again. This is interesting. Notice with this painting particularly, it's a charming painting, but notice how he's not interested in the geometry of the room at all. You've got the corner, she's standing in a corner there, but look where the wall corner is, the line of the wall corner is. It's completely wrong and deliberately wrong as well, obviously. Uh, he must have seen that. Possibly a sop to primitivism, um, a la Russo. It seems she was painted at a single sitting. The story goes that Modigliani had sent her out for some wine, 
but she returned with lemonade. Hence perhaps her contrite expression, and maybe it's why he stood her in the corner. That's rather a charming painting, I think. And I, I, I like the bright blues contrast well with the oranges and yellows of her face, the skin tones. Now this is a self-portrait painted in 1919. And this photograph taken in the same year shows you the absolute dichotomy between what the subject actually looked like and what he looked like in Modigliani's mind, even though this is actually the mind of Modigliani himself. So he painted himself looking like, looking rather sophisticated really, I suppose, with his, with his palette there. Um, but an and, and clean shaven, completely clean shaven. That's the first time we've seen Modigliani with a beard, actually. Missing his bohemian friends, he returned to Paris alone in 1919 and immediately took up with the mysterious Lunier Tchaikovsky. This is three portraits he did of Lunier. It said that under her influence, he enjoyed a period of calm until Jean returned and the downward spiral of his life resumed, drunkenness, brothels and drug taking. The neglect he endured by the art world bit deep into his will and self-esteem. Public recognition failed him and there are numerous accounts of him roaming the streets of Paris, intoxicated and soaked to the skin. Late in January 1920, he was admitted to hospital in a coma and died two year, days later. He was 36. This is one of the last portraits he painted. In fact, it was on his easel when he died. Here we see a heavily pregnant Jeanne carrying her second child. The paint, the colours here are much bolder, you'll notice, and, and the lines are truer as well, the stronger, stronger lines. Still the naive uh, hands and the paint and the head inclined to the right. It makes a rather gives her a sad expression and the eyes blanked out in blues again and the nose elongated and the long neck so very much in the Modigliani style. The face is drained of colour as I said the eyes blank and the tilt of the head suggests pathos, great sadness even. Tragically the day after Modigliani died a broken-hearted Jeanne threw herself out of her parents' fifth-floor window, killing herself and the unborn child instantly. Their daughter Jeanne was thus orphaned at the age of two, that's Jeanne later in life, and went on to be a celebrated Italian artist in her own right, dying in 1984. It's reported that at his funeral, dealers were already negotiating the price level of Modigliani's paintings. Was Modigliani an expressionist painter? He was certainly a key figure in the relentless and at times eccentric advance of modern art, and perhaps expressed the cultural upheaval of the early 20th century with his unique take on portraiture. He showed how paint and draftsmanship could be handled in ways never experienced before. Despite the chaotic nature of his private life, he never lost the outlook of a professional, dedicated artist. So that's all I've got to say about Modigliani. We'll now move on to Alberto Giacobetti. And there's a picture of 
um, Giacometti with his with um, one of his mannequins. He was a Swiss sculptor, painter, and printmaker. And we think of Giacometti primarily as a sculptor, I think, but he, he certainly painted as well, although I'm not going to talk about his paintings. Um, we, just, we just simply haven't got time. So I'm just going to concentrate on his sculptures. He was one of the most important sculptors of the 20th century. His work was particularly influenced by Cubism and Surrealism. And like Modigliani, his art was so unique, as I said in my opening remarks, he was basically his own art movement. Giacometti was born in Switzerland, the eldest son of Giovanni Giacometti, a well-known post-impressionist painter. Coming from this artistic background, Alberto was not unsurprisingly interested in art from an early age and attended the Geneva School of Fine Arts. In 1922, he moved to Paris to study under the sculptor Antoine Boudel, an associate of Rodin. It was here that Giacometti experimented with Cubism and Surrealism and came to be regarded as one of the leading surrealist sculptors. In 1925, he made his debut in the Salon d'Automne with this um, sculptor called Torso. The three elements of Torso's form are just about recognizable as a human body and legs, but are shaped in the direction of um, geometric clarity. So I'll leave you to look at that for a moment and absorb the, <coughs> the eye, the concept behind it. In 1927, Giacometti made a breakthrough by dissolving the solid form and allowing space to penetrate. This one he called couple. There is clearly an attempt at symbolic representation. While it still has an almost superficial feel, it is his first work to realize an integrated dynamic. Like many artists of his generation, including Modigliani, Giacometti was fascinated by tribal wood sculpture, and many of his early pieces reflect this. Giacometti worked with cubists, and it was his, this interchange of ideas that led to his first truly original uh, work, Gazing Head. This is only 16 inches tall uh, and to be found in America, as you can see. The museum's uh, com com commentary reads, and I quote, the theme of this sculpture, the act of seeing, also points to his future work. The fascination that surrounds the phenomenon of the gaze emanates from the work's flat surface. At the same time, the viewer is stuck, struck by the penetrating gaze of the deep set eye and is confronted with the presence that issues from this vision. So those are not my words, but the catalogue's words. When it was shown in 1929 in a Paris gallery, Giacometti immediately attracted the attention of the sur Surrealists, not so unsurprisingly. Until that point, he'd moved in a circle of young Italians, but now found himself associating with leading avant-garde exponents. Also at this time, he produced Spoon Woman, cast in bronze. This is also in in MoMA in New York. This is nearly uh, five foot high. And also this one, Reclining Woman Who Dreams. I'll leave you to work out where the reclining woman is and where dreams figure. However, around 1935, he gave up on surrealism 
to pursue a more in-depth analysis of figurative compositions and concentrating on sculpting the human head, focusing on his model's gaze. This is a sculptor of Diego, his brother, cast in 1951, 13 inches tall, as you can see. While imitation was his intention, the final results of his sculptures proved to be emotional responses to his subject. He once said that he was sculpting not the human figure, but the shadow that it cast. This was followed by a phase in which the statues became, became elongated through his unique take on reality. Often to his own consternation, he would carve and carve until his sculptures were razor thin. A friend once said that if Giacometti sculpted you, quote, I, he would make your head look like the blade of a knife. During World War II, Giacometti fled to Switzerland. And when peace reasserted itself in 1946, he met Annette Arm, a Red Cross worker. They married three years later but there was no children from the marriage. From about this time, his sculptures became larger, but thinner. And for the remainder of Giacometti's life, Annette was his main female model. Now take a look at Annette there, and then see her again sculpted there. This sculpture is 26 inches tall. Can't say it's flattering, but then again, if you've been sculpted by the great Giacometti, um, that would be praise enough, I think. It was a time when he created his most famous sculptures, his tall and slender figurines. He constantly reworked his mannequins, often destroying them or setting them aside to go back to later. When he returned to Paris in, in 45, at the end of the war, to the studio that he had, had been maintained by his brother Diego, Giacometti began to meet with Simon de Beauvoir and Jean-Paul Sartre, and he absorbed their ex existential philosophy. This one he produced in 1947, and it's called Nose. I don't think there's any point in me making any comments about these sculptors. I'm just happy to show them to you, I think, and let you draw your own conclusions. The dimensions are at the top there, give an idea of it. Giacometti's Man Falling, uh, created in 1950, and this is 24, this is two foot high, <clears throat> is iconic and existentialist in essence. The figure about to topple from its pedestal holds its position by throwing its head back almost ecstatically. It's said somewhat pretentiously, in my opinion, that Man Falling is the human being in an extreme situation in which his transcendental destiny becomes apparent. It's also said that Giacometti's post-war sculptures were seen by existentialists as an antidote to abstraction and that they were considered the raw, basic, core, essential stuff of the human condition. Three Men Walking Two, in an exhibition catalogue about this item, it was written, the rough, eroded, heavily worked surfaces typify his technique. Reduced as they are to their very core, these figures evoke lone trees in winter that have lost their foliage. And here they are in the exhibition itself, give you an idea of their of their scale. This one is called Chariot and the catalogue again reads, an Egyptian chariot, 
a filament-thin woman stands poised in precarious equilibrium as if perpetually suspended between movement and stasis, advance and retreat. According to the artist, the chariot was partly inspired by a memory of a sparkling pharmacy cart he saw when briefly hospitalized. It was also prompted by his desire to position a figure in empty space in order to see it better and to situate it at a precise distance from the floor. Of man walking, Giacometti himself said, you have a certain amount of clay, and at first you feel that you've given it more or less the right volume, and then to make it more real, you take away, take away, and you could in fact stretch it to infinity. And this is six foot tall, almost, uh, Man, man size really, well it is man size, <clears throat> except that the legs are extraordinarily thin. It's widely held that the reduced thickness of Giacometti's figures reflect modern life as being increasingly empty and devoid of meaning. In 1962, he was awarded the grand prize for sculpture at the Venice Biennale, and the award brought it with it worldwide fame. Giacometti died in 1966 of heart disease in Switzerland. <clears throat> 